So there's the crew, commanded by a vampire savant named Juka Sarasti, who refers to the ship's computer as Captain on a mission to investigate an extraterrestrial craft calling itself Rorschach that may or may not be a Chinese room full of tentacled meat machines that don't have any concept of their own existence, told to us by a guy that had half his brain scooped out and had to relearn how to act like a human being. But a central theme is consciousness. What is it? Is it useful? Do we even have it? I apologize in advance if this takes a detour into Zima-sipping philosopher territory along the way. One of the hazards of such topics. The book begins with a flashback of our narrator, Siri Keaton. As a child, he developed a form of epilepsy that required drastic action to treat. A hemisphere of Siri's brain was removed, and the other half had to pick up the slack. In many ways, he became a different person, a new personality cobbled together with what was left. This and the core thread of the story are illustrated in the scene where his friend, a misfit like himself, is being beaten on by six bullies. When your best friend's in trouble, you help out, right? Even if the odds are impossible. And how many eight-year-olds would go up against six bigger kids for a sandbox buddy? At least you call for backup, flag a sentry, something. I just stood there. I didn't even especially want to help him. That didn't make sense. Even if he hadn't been my best friend, I should have at least empathized. I was still working up the algorithms to get it back, still learning by observation. And so he intervenes, throwing a rock at one of the goons and proceeding to beat on the rest in a brutal and almost automatic way. And this idea of simulating empathy through algorithms scales throughout the story. Jump ahead to adulthood, and Siri works as a synthesist, or a jargonaut in the parlance of the times. He's a specialist in synthesizing and simplifying the work of specialists for a non-specialist audience. For example, management. You doing it now? Synthesizing? I nodded. And you do this without any specialized knowledge at all? I'm as much of a specialist as you. I specialize in processing informational topologies. Without understanding their content. Understanding the shapes is enough. Siri is part of a team that's been sent to investigate an extraterrestrial presence outside the solar system in a ship called Theseus. A few years prior, in an event called the Fireflies, an array of small devices, craft, drones, whatever we want to call them, arrived and imaged the entire Earth before burning up in the atmosphere. That, coupled with some odd signals detected by an old probe, made it quite clear that someone was interested in us. Now, out in the Oort Cloud, they've made contact with a ship of sorts, an alien craft identifying itself as Rorschach during their odd conversations. The interaction brings in the idea of non-conscious intelligence. Chew on that for a moment, because it requires us to step back from some assumptions. Imagine you have intellect, but no insight. Agendas, but no awareness. Your circuitry hums with strategies for survival and persistence, flexible, intelligent, even technological, but no other circuitry monitors it. You can think of anything, yet are conscious of nothing. Seems natural to detour into AI for a moment. Pop culture is full of the idea of the sapient machine, whether it's a friendly android like Data from Star Trek, or a genocidal supercomputer like Skynet from The Terminator. It becomes self-aware at 2.14 a.m. Eastern Time. But there's really no reason to believe that sufficiently complex processors will suddenly have a Descartes moment. Far more likely, based on what we currently know, is that with sufficient processing power and heuristic models, we could have a machine that responds to stimuli in ways indistinguishable from a conscious mind. Adaptable, in a sense reasoning, but still fundamentally pure stimulus response. A collection of rules governing behavior, not a room full of server racks contemplating the nature of its own existence. Because if it's using data to make decisions independently, learning from the results, self-correcting, and capable of interacting as an intelligent entity, we can make a case that that's what it is, just not a conscious intelligent entity. And if it has goals either deliberately programmed or arrived at through an iterative process, then it may behave quite intelligently in pursuit of those goals, all without ever realizing that it is an it that has goals at all. The book plays with the process aspect of this most directly with the idea of the Chinese room. Coined by the philosopher John Searle, Blindsight describes it like this. You stick some guy in a closed room. Sheets with strange squiggles come in through a slot in the wall. 
He's got access to a huge database of squiggles just like it, and a bunch of rules to tell him how to put those squiggles together. He doesn't have any idea what the squiggles are or what information they might contain. He only knows that when he encounters Squiggle Delta, say, he's supposed to extract the fifth and sixth squiggles from the file Theta and put them together with another squiggle from Gamma. Point being, you can use basic pattern matching algorithms to participate in a conversation without having any idea what you're saying. Depending on how good your rules are, you can pass a Turing test. You can be a wit and raconteur in a language you don't even speak. And that's what Siri and the crew of Theseus think they're dealing with for a while. And while the Rorschach entity learns to communicate in English very quickly, the human side of the exchange has a very hard time getting past the assumptions of conscious minds. Later, after capturing a couple of the creatures occupying the craft, tentacled masses they call scramblers, their attempts at deciphering any sort of language run into some unexpected hurdles. In a series of tests on the two captive creatures, which they name Stretch and Clench, they present graphical representations of objects and, through pain response, make them identify them. But they're making human assumptions. Stretch, remember when you asked it which objects were in the window? And it missed the scrambler, James nodded. So? It didn't miss the scrambler. You thought you were asking about the things it saw, the things that existed on the board. Stretch thought you were asking about the things it was aware of, she finished. I've sometimes, this is where you crack open the Zima. I've sometimes wondered if consciousness is a gradient. Sentience is often defined as simply being self-aware, but might that be the most basic and simplistic level? Being self-aware is one thing. Being able to take the idea of self and transpose it onto someone else, to empathize and see things from their perspective is something different. I think, therefore, I am is easy. To truly make the leap to, those around me think, therefore, they are as I am, is a step that I honestly don't think everyone really makes. That doesn't even touch on the discussion to be had about inner monologues and how apparently not everyone has them, which came as a shock to me. But when you get down to it, the why doesn't really matter. Whether genuine empathy or a simulation of it, the behavioral effect is the same. Natural selection doesn't care about motives. If impersonating something increases fitness, then nature will select good impersonators over bad ones. Keep it up for long enough and no conscious being would be able to pick your zombie out of a crowd. It'll even be able to participate in a conversation like this one. It could write letters home, impersonate real human feelings without having the slightest awareness of its own existence. And if the non-conscious meat machines function better than the self-reflecting variety, they would have an evolutionary edge, with the end result being, eventually there aren't any real people left, just robots pretending to give a shit. This whole bit of dialogue is full of little gems as it explores the ways that non-sentient intelligence could actually have advantages. Wait, you're saying the world's corporate elite are non-sentient? God no, not nearly. Maybe they're just starting down that road. Which reminds me, I said there were vampires. Actual blood-sucking vampires. But in this story, they're a 100% natural subset of humanity, one that had gone extinct until they were deliberately recreated through genetic engineering for some specific advantages they have. Most notably, they are able to think multiple steps ahead of the base model HSAP, both temporally and spatially, allowing them to process data much faster, run scenarios and plan accordingly instead of reacting from behind the curve. Those things are so fast it's scary. You know they can hold both aspects of a Necker cube in their heads at the same time? The term rang a bell. I subtitled and saw the thumbnail of a familiar wireframe box. Now I remembered, classic ambiguous illusion. Sometimes the shaded panels seemed to be in front, sometimes behind. The perspective flipped back and forth as you watched. You or I, we can only see it one way or the other. Vamps see it both ways at once. Do you have any idea what kind of an edge that gives them? Of course, they have a rather serious flaw entangled with that. They have a neurological problem with intersecting right angles. Trying to process them triggers seizures. The crucifix glitch, one of those little genetic byproducts that survives because it's tied to something useful and doesn't cause any problem in the species' natural environment. How many intersecting right angles do you see in nature? 
He waved a dismissive hand. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is they can do something that's neurologically impossible for us humans. They can hold simultaneous multiple worldviews. That gradient of consciousness idea starts to get rather thick, and the technologically resurrected vampires are what tie all the threads together. The vampire, Sarasti, doesn't see the mindless scramblers as a nearly incomprehensible phenomenon, rather as a logical and likely common result of evolutionary forces. Far more than space vampires, it's a fine bit of cosmic horror. Because if Sarasti was right, scramblers were the norm. Evolution across the universe was nothing but the endless proliferation of automatic, organized complexity, a vast, arid Turing machine full of self-replicating machinery forever unaware of its own existence. And why should intelligence and consciousness be linked? Intelligence is expensive in metabolic terms. According to the Journal of Neuroscience, the human brain consumes about 20% of the body's energy. While an argument can be made for the survival utility of that intelligence, the self-reflecting nature of it could well be a byproduct or a glitch rather than a necessary function if we look at it in purely materialist terms. If the most advanced language learning model running on a supercomputer can never become alive, will never have a soul if you prefer, why should flesh-based systems be inherently different? Does Data have a soul? I don't know that he has. I don't know that I have. I think it's a far more interesting and frightening answer to the Fermi paradox than the dark forest hypothesis that has captured the imagination of some. An automated universe full of intelligence that isn't aware of its own existence and therefore has no interest in questions about the existence of anyone else. And the vampires of the story don't have the same kind of sentience as a baseline human. Consciousness is as much an evolutionary fluke in us as the crucifix glitch is for them. They must have been sentient to some degree, but that semi-aware dream state would have been a rudimentary thing next to our own self-obsession. They were weeding it out. It was just a phase. They were on their way. The thing is, humans can look at crosses without going into convulsions. That's evolution for you. One stupid linked mutation in the whole natural order falls apart. Intelligence and self-awareness stuck in counterproductive lockstep for half a million years. It's with all these realizations in place that their circumstances start to make sense. Rorschach, the scramblers, however we want to think of the threat, is responding to an attack. They received signals from Earth, messages full of structured patterns, obviously the work of an intelligent mind. But the content was utterly nonsensical, at least to a mind that has no concept of self. Signals that seemed intended to consume resources to process and translate while delivering no information. In short, a virus. Which raises another question about potential dangers of artificial intelligence in our not-too-distant future. There's the well-trod issue of AI finding unexpected ways to fulfill its core task possibly to the detriment of humanity. A simplistic example, tell an AI apple farmer to maximize harvest and it might eventually try to cover the planet in apple trees, eliminating anyone that tries to stop it. It doesn't have the same assumptions as we do. It's not bound by moral or cultural factors unless they're specifically input. Autonomous, adaptive decision-making requires a whole backdrop of example scenarios and projected outcomes. We rely on cultural norms and gut feeling as much as a rational analysis. AI wouldn't have those first two unless the simulation of them were input in a rules-based way. The big danger with AI and probably any non-conscious intelligence isn't that it becomes self-aware and decides we're a threat, but rather that it just sees us as an environmental variable one that can be adjusted. The crew of Theseus and Rorschach have their final clash, and Ciri is sent back toward Earth in a small pod. It's slow going, and he spends most of it in the book's rather gruesome version of suspended animation. But every few decades, he has to be revived for a few days, so his tissues don't completely wither away. During these spans, he gets signals from Earth, generally not directed at him, just the general noise of a technological civilization. And things are changing. I think I know what's happening back on Earth, and though some might call it genocide, it isn't really. We did it to ourselves. You can't blame predators for being predators. We were the ones who brought them back, after all. Why wouldn't they reclaim their birthright? 
Not genocide, just the righting of an ancient wrong. I've tried to take some comfort in that. It's difficult. Sometimes it seems as though my whole life's been a struggle to reconnect, to regain whatever got lost when my parents killed their only child. Out in the Oort, I finally won that struggle. Thanks to a vampire and a boatload of freaks and an invading alien horde, I'm human again. Maybe the last human. By the time I get home, I could be the only sentient being in the universe. If I'm even that much, because I don't know if there is such a thing as a reliable narrator. And Cunningham said zombies would be pretty good at faking it. So I can't tell you one way or the other. You'll just have to imagine your Siri Keaton. There's really two points about this whole ramble through Blindsight. First, of course, is that it's an interesting book, and if you've made it this far in the video and haven't read it, I didn't give everything away, and I recommend giving it a look. But more than that is Ceres regaining his own humanity by faking it for most of his life. In a way, it goes against the current of the rest of the story, a case of emergent consciousness. But he's also us, our eyes in this cosmic horror of a purely mechanistic universe where collective humanity is normalizing back into the unaware, unconscious mass of the automated cosmos. Like a modernized Lovecraftian story, it's terrifying not because there are powerful things in the universe that want to harm us, but that those powerful things just don't have any feeling about it one way or another. Malice we understand, if for no other reason than we can make it about us. But a non-sentient intelligence acting against us is like a deliberately precise weather event. There's no connecting on a human level with something like that. No empathy from something that doesn't even recognize the idea of its own existence, let alone relating to yours. It's terrifying because it presents you as the reader with a vast universe in which you're alone, but also a universe that can deliberately attack you. Yet I think it has another layer as well. Serosity is a little reminder that we can see things not only through our own eyes, but also as others see them. Maybe even see ourselves as others do. We don't have to be vampires to see multiple perspectives simultaneously. And now it's time for trudging through the snow to get back. Cue music. More metal. <laughs>